you all hear me? Great, thank you. Um, if you haven't had enough of me talking at you today, I'm back again. So uh, thank you for those who came along to the museum this morning. I hope you enjoyed your visit. Um, forgot to add that we're open every day, uh, what, Tuesday to Saturday, one till five, um, and always free. So please come back again if you'd like to visit. So I promised you more information on our recent um, Papyrus for the People project at the Petrie Museum. Now, when I saw the theme for the conference, I couldn't help but think that the project fit into many of the different um, uh, subjects that you're hoping to cover today in the conference and tomorrow. So in terms of, very much in terms of positive action and sustainability for um, collections care, collections management, interpretation, um, and the long-term um, preservation of the collection, this project, I think, fulfills um, that particular brief. So uh, what is Papyrus for the People? Now, this was an Arts uh, Council England funded project um, as part of the Designation Development Fund um, that started in 2017 and continued to 2018. I should say that my predecessor, Alice, William, uh, Al Alice Williams, Alice Stevenson, apologies, um, was responsible for the, um, the construction of the application uh, with Maria Reagan, who was the uh, previous manager of the Petrie Museum. I came in halfway, uh, which I was very fortunate to do. And there was uh, funding as part of the project for um, a project curator who was um, Louise Bascoom, who had a fixed term contract and is now with uh, National Museums Greenwich, which we're very pleased about. So the Petrie Museum's papyrus collection, I showed you the storage and some of the displays today. So we have two, over 2,000 documents in the Petrie Museum which represent multiple faiths, identities, and worldviews. It's a world-class collection and of significant international interest. So, as I said, it's part of the Designation Development Fund. The project lasted for 18 months, and it was intended to cover um, these particular aspects. So, everything from conservation, documentation, storage, um, aspects of scientific research, outreach and programming, loans and exhibitions, and uh, different aspects of training. So sustainability, making the collection as resilient as possible, and positive action um, for um, promoting, and, um, and cons promoting the papyrus collection and, um, and preserving it for the future. So I'd like to discuss a couple of these points, um, starting first with conservation. So at the start of the project, um, there was a survey undertaken of the papyrus collection to, identi to identify which of the, um, the frames, so the papyrus is held within glass frames, which of the frames required the most, um, the most attention. And you'll see that that's everything from the top left-hand corner here, where the tape has come away, um, right down to um, glass being broken, um, and various other issues which was affecting the, um, the, uh, the preservation, the conservation of the material. And this survey was undertaken by our previous uh, senior conservator, Susie Pancaldo, um, along with um, a conservator from, who I have a photograph of, I'll show you um, as we go along, um, Varni Aresis from the British Library, who was responsible for um, the conservation work on the papyri. And so when the um, most pressing frames were identified for conservation, um, here's Varnia now. Um, she's working in the lab at UCL um, in, the, um, in the basement of the Rockefeller Centre here. Um, so Varnia conserved 41 um, papyri, so that includes different um, fragments in, um, in the same frame. And this is everything from, as I said, retaping um, to replacing the glass, um, to actually rejoining fragments physically within the frame um, which, which weren't in the right position. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of technical process. Um, and Varnia is a papyrus conservator, so she was the perfect person to work on, um, on that. So the papyrus collection itself um, is, as I said, of world-class international interest, um, but it's the stories within the papyri that we wanted to harness and to promote to, um, to our visitors. Now, in order to do that, we worked with language specialists. Now, much of the papyri has already been translated um, in, um, for a scholarly audience, 
Um, so that includes much of the work of my predecessor, um, Professor Stephen Quirk, um, focusing uh, mainly on the hieratic uh, material. But what we wanted to do is to take the texts and take the existing translations and kind of translate them again to make them as accessible as possible for, um, for a broader audience. As I said this morning, it's only really by harnessing the stories in the papyri um, that, that visitors, um, that you might present, uh, prevent visitors from just walking straight past the documents, but actually kind of looking, observing, and then looking closer to see, um, to see the details of these stories. And so working with our language specialists, 120 texts were translated in total, um, and their names are listed here. I want to thank them um, for all of their fantastic work. Um, so Joseph Clayton, in particular, translated many of the texts which you saw today um, in the cases in the museum. So we have the translations and the conservation that went on, but the documentation was also a really important aspect of the project. So in terms of, again, sustainability for the project, um, we ensured that um, not only that the, um, the texts were translated, but that the frames were photographed. So as I mentioned, on our online database, um, we have a comprehensive, document, a comprehensive <coughs> records for each object in terms of um, object number, provenance, uh, date. It's not all always there, but in general, each object has a record with an image. But we wanted to take that one step further and kind of harness that, um, the documentation for each, um, each fragment of papyrus to be able to present that online. So that also includes new photography. So there was a survey done by Louise, who is the project curator, for every um, frame which didn't already have um, a high resolution image. So that, that fo um, those photographs were taken. Um, also in collaboration with volunteers in the museum. So it was a great opportunity for us to train volunteers um, to be able to set up the photography space, um, to photograph the objects, but then also to work with Photoshop to, um, to kind of um, improve those images so that we have the best possible um, resolution, the best possible detail for people to access. Um, and this is just highlighting some of Louise's work. She was absolutely diligent in um, documenting every scrap of information about the papyri, um, the different frames, the different fragments. And so that was everything from um, pieces of um, uh, archive documentation that were kept with the papyri, making sure that was all documented on, uh, on our database. We use AdLib um, for that. And then that will again be hosted online, so all of this information will be um, fully accessible um, to the public, to whoever would like to, to access it. Even down to old mounts. So we went through some of the old mounts and decided what was useful to be kept, but some of them are very, um, in terms of the history of the collection, they are quite old. Um, and uh, it was decided that aspects of the, the history of display of the papyri would also be kept to be able to tell that story. So again, these are just some screenshots of the kind of detailed information that you can now access um, for, the, for the papyri that were studied as part of the project. So whereas before, this might have had um, perhaps a couple of lines on the theme of the text, or um, it might have had the, the scholarly translation of the text. Um, now, that, that translation um, is, has been made as accessible as possible, while still being historically a, an accurate and uh, with attention to detail, but um, more accessible for, for people who might be interested more in the, the stories behind the, um, behind the texts. So we've just worked on an upgrade of our database. We're hoping in the new year, she says, to have an upgrade of the online interface. So um, all being well in the new year, this will be able to be um, uh, accessed. So I showed you the new storage as well that the project funded. Um, previously, there were two cupboards in... Oh, sorry, in the, um, in the entrance area, and these were wooden cupboards. So again, not ideal storage for this type of material. Um, the cupboards would, um, were off-gassing, for example, but now we have um, state-of-the-art pole stores that mean that we can safely and securely store the papyri. The large standing cupboard also has a glass front, which means that visitors can see inside the cupboard 
Um, it has um, a film over it, so it's, it's uh, safe in terms of um, uh, the light in the space. But it means that if visitors are interested to know what's inside, they can now, um, they can now see that. So working through the project, it became apparent that by kind of promoting the papyrus collection, um, both within UCL and beyond UCL, um, scientific researchers uh, became more aware of the, the papyrus collection and more interested to work with it. So this is an example um, of work that was undertaken in the medical physics department here at UCL um, on multispectral imaging of some of the papyri. What, was, what interested them in particular is that there were papyrus fragments that came out of um, cartonnage. So um, in the, um, uh, I would say, kind of 60s, 70s, um, the cartonnage, which was made of, um, in some cases, fragments of papyrus, was actually destroyed to access the texts within it so that those texts could be read. Um, obviously, we don't do that nowadays, um, but we do have to work with the results of that, that work. Um, so this, this really important scientific research comes as a direct result of the papyrus project and means that we're able to, um, again, gather more information about these fragments, which may otherwise um, have sat um, in, a, in a drawer um, until, the fu until future um, research opportunities. Now, in terms of events and outreach, um, I would say this is one of the, the biggest impacts of the project. And so I mentioned that we'll try to harness the stories from the papyri. It wasn't just, um, although it's very important, to present those in a museum context, but it was also to translate them again in terms of public outreach, um, whether inside the museum or outside the museum. And uh, during the course of the project, which, as I said, ran for 18 months, we had 24 different mm -hmm. events, um, 24 different events with 55 events in total. So some of those were kind of day over a day with different events running at the same time. And as you can see, more than 1,800 people engaged with the collection through these events. Now, um, this is necessarily, this amount of people wouldn't have engaged with the papyrus collection unless the project had been ongoing. Um, so that's, that's a real um, kind of tangible output from the project. And these events range from everything to um, art installations, uh, dramatic performances, um, storytelling events, um, our very popular Halloween event, where, which also included storytelling based on the stories coming out of the papyri um, and the translations. Um, what was really popular as well is um, in UCL, we held lost skills workshops. Um, so this included will writing workshops um, with representatives from the legal department, letter writing workshops, um, and also people who came in to talk about list writing. This idea that we have these skills, these important skills, which are slowly being lost um, as the world becomes more digital. Perhaps you make your shopping list on your phone now instead of scribbling it on a piece of paper. Um, and this was another way in which we could kind of harness different audiences to come into the museum as part of the project. So, for example, for the will writing workshop, because we have um, one of the earliest examples of a will in the museum, in the collection. So we're trying to use the collection to kind of inform these events. We were, um, the legal representative from the, the legal department was giving really important information to people who wanted to ask about will writing, who might not otherwise have been comfortable to approach um, another kind of legal representative at that time, but wanted a more informal discussion all framed around this idea that we're still doing the same type of things today that the ancient Egyptians did thousands of years ago. So as part of the project, we, as I said, we also have creative uh, interventions. So we had a private view for the project, which uh, ran in April. Uh, the left here is um, a photograph of the performance piece that we had uh, commissioned by an artist called Laura Wilson who's a kind of up-and-coming artist in the London area. And this was based on um, a text which describes a list of stone draggers. I mentioned one of these has a female name. And this, uh, this is one of the papyri which is on display in the museum. She was really interested in 
the idea of stone dragging and the kind of noise that would be created through, um, you know, in the, in the quarry or as part of the stone dragging process. And so for the private view, she had these, in, these, um, these performers sit there and grinding stones in a very rhythmic way. And all I can describe it as is we were sitting in the theatre and we were all sat around the, um, uh, sat around the grinders in the middle. And it was, it was just as if you were transported to somewhere completely different. It was a very kind of um, evocative kind of soundscape that she was creating. So again, another, adding another level to, um, to our interpretation of, um, of the, the collection. And to the right here, this is work that we did with um, Central St. Martins. So every year, students from Central St. Martins um, create these kind of artistic interventions which are dotted around the museum. And in, the, in this year, they wanted to work with, um, with texts, with the stories coming from the papyrus translations, but also this idea of ancient texts in general. Um, and this is an example which I really liked of a modern vessel um, which was smashed um, outside of the museum. They did that at home. And then they created uh, Ostraca, they created, um, they put text and pasted newspaper articles onto the inside of the vessel and then recreated the vessel to try to kind of um, explore issues of like reuse and um, um, repair and how texts were used in, in places that you wouldn't ordinarily think of. So you had to look quite closely to look inside to see these texts. So again, it's kind of using the collection um, as a kind of foundation, as a jumping point for um, kind of creative intervention and, and just thinking, thinking of outside the box about what can be done with these collections and, and to try to kind of engage different audiences. <coughs> So as part of the project, we also loaned um, papyri to particular um, exhibitions, which I've highlighted here. Um, so this, this partly um, was um, serendipitous, the timing for these loans, but it, again, it was, another, um, it was another opportunity for us to be able to showcase our papyrus collection, both within UCL. Um, so we had two exhibitions, one at the Grant Museum um, and one in the Octagon space at UCL. Um, which is a public exhibition space, um, which highlighted um, a papyri from our collection. And also at the Atkinson in Southport, um, where they had an exhibition highlighting um, the, um, a traveller, um, a female traveller in Egypt called Mrs. Goodison, um, and used um, this particular papyrus from the collection, which is um, it's a large representation, representation of a shrine. Um, alongside other objects in the collection to tell the story of her travels through Egypt. I mentioned that we um, also hosted um, and led on training sessions relating to the project. Um, so Louise uh, Bascombe, the project curator, um, absolutely conceived of these and, um, and kind of implemented them. So everything from the left there, that's our museum volunteers working with Louise on glass cleaning so not all of the papyri were conserved as part of the project. As I said, there was a survey undertaken to find the, um, uh, the most kind of um, pressing frames uh, that needed conservation, but all of them needed a good clean. Um, and this is, this is quite a technical process, um, but it's one that once, um, once you're trained, you're able to then kind of cascade that training. And that was what Louise was able to do. So she was um, trained by Vania Assis, who was the conservator we were working with, to then train the volunteers who came back several times to um, continue the project. And for them, it's a great opportunity for kind of hands-on um, hands work with the collection, um, particularly with papyri, which um, is quite an unusual, um, relatively unusual object type to be able to work with. Um, as I mentioned, <coughs> volunteers were also used in, um, for the papyrus photography. So, um, this was Louise training the volunteers to set up the, as I said, the um, photography area um, to photograph and then to process the images um, afterwards. And these images will be hosted online. And importantly, for each of these um, the object records, we have the, the record of each, and each volunteer who was responsible for the photography. So their name will be associated with that work, which is really important for us 
as much as um, it's great to have all of this fantastic documentation, it was really also an opportunity for them to um, to boost their CVs um, and to be able to yeah to be able to present more of the work in a tangible way that they do in the museum. We also worked with uh, Access, the um, subject specialist network for Egypt and Sudan, um, and we ran a professional workshop um, for museum professionals who worked with papyrus collections, which ran. Uh, in April at UCL. This was a great opportunity for skills sharing and also again to be able to try to cascade the results of the project because while we were very fortunate to get the funding uh, to undertake this project, some of the outcomes that we um, that, that were produced are relevant for for different collections, not only for the Petrie Museum. And so it was as much of a way for us to share the kind of results that we'd um, that we'd gained from the project as it was to learn from other people. Um, and the day was, was a great success. Where would we be without social media? Um, now, Louise in particular, she worked very hard to publicize the, the project. So if you'd like to read any more on the project, um, the UCL Museums and Collections blog um, is absolutely comprehensive in terms of the work that was done. Louise wrote several blog posts we also had guest blog posts from our um, translators. Um, we worked with um, Museum Crush, for example, who um, approached us to, um, to write, to, to, to send content for a kind of um, focus piece on the Papyrus project. Um, again, this is with the hope of engaging um, different audiences again, the kind of audiences that might, um, that might, I don't know, sit there on the tube and kind of scroll through and want to read more of the stories um, that came out of the project. Um, of course, um, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram um, were very busy around the time of the project. So if you're interested to go back through our various social media channels and have a look at um, the, uh, the kind of posts that we were sharing. So just very briefly, I'd like to, um, you've all seen the new displays now, um, so I won't go on about them too much, but I'd really like to show you um, I mean, really the most tangible output in the museum of the, of the project. And so these are new cases which I showed you in the museum. Um, we've got three new cases, um, with two of which explore themes relating to the Papyrus project. Um, and the idea with these, these new displays was not only to provide um, a safe and secure environment to, um, to show the papyri, but also to use the objects in the collection, in our vast collection at the museum, um, to inform the texts, to kind of bring, go one step further to bring the stories, bringing the stories to life. Um, so the first case, which I showed you um, in the left, um, kind of in the corner of the room, um, explores women's, um, women in the workplace in ancient Egypt. Now, for this, we used a combination of papyri, but also inscribed stone material that had been translated by the, um, by the language specialists we were working with. Um, I should also add that their translations are fully credited as well on, on the database. And it was fantastic because we had objects such as the stela to the right here, which mentions a sistrum player, but we also have a sistrum, a kind of ritual rattle, um, here in, to the left, um, an intact sistrum in the collection. So we're able to pair those two objects together to, we hope, um, really kind of showcase that story and to create as much interest as possible. As I said, I'm not a philologist, although I can fully appreciate uh, the ancient languages that have been um, part of this project, but I'm a ceramicist and uh, I couldn't resist but to get more pots into the display. Um, so the second case, as I mentioned, takes um, a fragment of papyrus, which is the lower section here in the frame. Um, sadly, not one of the frames which had been beautifully conserved, but again, it was the story that I wanted to showcase here. Um, and it was a list of containers. So thinking about how we could possibly make a list of containers interesting to a general audience, because um, really it seems quite boring on the outset. So um, taking objects which represent the types of objects in the list um, and really trying to yeah, take the objects and use them to inform the texts as much as the texts are informing our understanding of the objects as I mentioned. 
These are both uh, temporary displays. So they'll be coming down in December and then we'll have a new display going up in January. I've been pushing this quite a lot this morning. So you'll forgive me if I just do another little push. Um, part of the project, um, but again, a kind of um, happy coincidence was that we were approached by um, a lighting company and a tech company to produce an app for the museum. Now, this is, while the app covers the whole of the museum, we're able to um, integrate some of the translations from the papyri into the app, um, which has meant that we've, again, we've kind of had that opportunity to present layered information um, about the project. Um, the issue of sustainability with this particular app, as I mentioned, um, is uh, tricky in a way because I think, in my opinion, a digital product is only as sustainable as the person who's updating the content. That person is me, so you've got me to blame if uh, this particular project isn't sustainable. But I have every faith that it is. It's very user-friendly in terms of the back end. Um, I'm not particularly technical, and um, it means that I can really easily update content. Um, but what's really special about this particular app, which you can download for free, um, from the Google Play Store and the App Store, is that it's part of a smart lighting system. Now, all around the museum, there are Bluetooth beacons, which, some of which are dotted around on the ceiling, but otherwise they're integrated into the lights around the main table. And they kind of transmit a Bluetooth signal to your phone when you have the app open, which means that um, content will pop up on your phone relating to where you're standing in the museum. So at the moment, it does, it does work. It integrates kind of guided um, tours on the top 10 objects, particular themed tours like on the papyrus um, cases. But it also means that in the future, we have the opportunity to map visitors' activity around the, the museum space. This was, for us, completely free of charge. The companies approached us as a case study. Um, so we're very fortunate to have this. But it means, again, it's another... Um, fortuitous output of the Papyrus project, but not directly associated with it. So in terms of future work, um, as I said, we'll be um, changing the Papyrus displays every six to eight months. We'll continue to write um, sector publications on best practice um, and continue to highlight the collection. We'd love to see our volunteer training continue because we think we really do believe that that's um, it's a very positive um, opportunity for our volunteers and also great for us at the same time. I should add that part of the project we've been working with um, partially sighted uh, groups based in London and we've developed um, an audio described tour which will be um, hosted on the app and will also include some of the translations. So we'll have um, some of the translation um, voiced for blind and partially sighted visitors, which has been an interesting challenge because they're very two-dimensional objects which aren't in any way tactile, even if you were able to kind of to touch them. But it's really important that those stories were made available to as wide audience as possible. For example, we've also got um, underneath here, we were also able, um, before this um, papyrus project started, to produce um, tactile booklets, including Braille, um, which were based on objects from the collection and 3D printed objects from the collection. So this includes textual material and um, probably the most challenging output of this project, but one that I'm really looking forward to, is that one member of the partially sighted um, group that came, um, South East London Vision, said that she wanted to learn how to read hieroglyphs and could I teach her? Now that came as a direct result of the Papyrus project and really is something that I think we can tie into um, our 3D printed material and to the stories which have come out of the Papyrus project. It would be a challenging, um, it would be challenging but a very positive project and I think one that I really want to, um, to, to get to do. So um, watch this space. Um, so thank you very much. If you have any more questions on the project, please let me know. Um, and I'd be really pleased to hear what you think of the displays. Thank you so much.